Well, welcome to another episode of Chronicles Magazine Podcast. Of course, I am CJ Hingle, the host of Chronicles Magazine Podcast, and I have with me today Michael Millerman, and he's going to introduce himself in a second, but um, some of you may know him as basically the guy to go to to understand the political philosophy of Alexander Dugan. So, Michael, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you actually, um, you're an independent scholar, um, basically, right now. You um, you had a little bit of experience in traditional higher education, but had something happen to you. Do you want to set that up for us? Sure. Briefly, I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto, the Department of Political Science, working on political philosophy. My dissertation studied the reception of Heidegger in political theory, so how Leo Strauss read Heidegger, Derrida, Rorty, other great figures in the tradition of political thought. And one of the people I'm interested in is Dugan. Dugan is also a very thoughtful reader of Heidegger. He belongs to the Russian Heidegger reception. And so I did work on Dugan. I was one of the first people to translate him into English, subsequently translated several of his books. And, you know, I was giving interviews about him even as a graduate student. And uh, not everybody in my academic circles liked that. They felt that you shouldn't really take anti-liberal or illiberal right-wing thought as seriously as I was taking it. And uh, they had all the typical issues that liberals and leftists have with platforming controversial figures. So I had a little bit of a scandal at the University of Toronto, and that's okay. It ended up being a blessing in disguise because after I left, I was able to go an independent route, teach online, tutor online. And now I have millermanschool.com where I teach and other ways that I get to discuss these things kind of without that uh, censorship and um, sword hanging over me that threatens serious work on anti-liberal or illiberal authors. You know, when a lot of people have been interested in understanding Heidegger and other, you know, continental critics of liberalism, but what made you look eastward? I mean, what it doesn't seem like a natural place to look if you want to understand, you know, the illiberal, illiberal perspectives. I mean, you mentioned Derrida and others that were coming westward. Um, but so, where did you find out about Dugan, and what made you want to read more? So, let me take the first part because actually, how I put together Dugan's Heidegger with the rest of the Heidegger reception, I think uh, I want to say separ separately. So first of all, uh, as I've mentioned in other contexts, before I was a student at university, I had pre-existing interests mm -hmm. in mysticism, mystical spirituality, comparative mysticism, mystical theology, that kind of thing. Then when I started my university studies, I fell in love with Plato. Plato's Republic was the first book in my philosophy class. I still read it. I still teach it. I still reread it. So you had mysticism, then the figure of the philosopher king and Plato's philosophy. And then the third piece of the puzzle is that my family's from the former Soviet Union. Uh, they emigrated from Moldova. I was born in Canada. But still, I had some exposure to Russian language, some exposure to you know um, the culture of the former USSR, and so on. So putting these three things together, mysticism, philosopher king, and the Russia side of things, I came across an article about Dugin that brought those threads together. They, in effect, said that he was Russia's mystical philosopher king. So it's like, okay, okay, that's intriguing. So I continued to find out more about him. I looked him up. At the time, there wasn't too much material available in English, but because of my Russian background, I could listen to some of his lectures in Russian or whatever else was available. And I came across this idea of his called the fourth political theory. He gave it in a five-minute talk. In effect, he says 20th century ideology was a warfare between liberalism, communism, and fascism. You know, fascism fell out of the scene. Then it was a bipolar world, Cold War world, liberalism versus communism. Communism collapsed. Liberalism was the last ideology standing. It's analysis of that situation and says you can be anti-liberal today without being either communist or fascist. Mm -hmm. That idea resonated with me. And so I kept looking him up. And the specific connection with Heidegger, besides the fact that he writes that, for example, Heidegger is the deepest foundation of the fourth political theory, is that I was translating some of his work on Heidegger at the same time as, as I was in a course on the French Heideggerians. So I saw at one in the same moment, two fundamentally different ways of interpreting Heidegger and constructing a political theory on the basis of his thought. One represented by the French thinkers and one represented by Dugan, which is quite different. Mm -hmm. And so at that time I wrote an article called Heidegger Left and Right, 
And that's sort of how I started to build this model of a comparative study of Heidegger receptions. Mm -hmm. Would you say that um, your interest in Strauss played into any of this at all? Yeah, very much so for several reasons, because for Strauss too, Heidegger is the deepest thinker. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, Strauss says, um, we have to make the great, he says, rationalistic liberalism is in a crisis. And it, we have to make the greatest effort to come to its defense or to think it through or something like that. But um, only the greatest thinker can help us. And the greatest thinker is Heidegger, a non-liberal or anti-liberal thinker. Mm -hmm. Strauss all the time in several of his writings, I could give you all the proof texts if we need to, but um, take my word for it. Otherwise, he regarded Heidegger as the peak, the best philosopher of our time and of the last 500 years, Okay, we could say. Um, so that's another thing. How do people as radically different in their political theory as Strauss, Dugan, Derrida, and Rorty, for example, to take the four that I wrote about in my dissertation and in my book, how do people as different as they are all agree about the primacy of Heidegger? Mm -hmm. And what accounts for their differences? So that's one thing. Strauss is the authority for me. I mean, Strauss is the person who introduced me to the big questions of political philosophy. And so you could say that on his authority, I'm justified in taking an interest in anybody who's a serious reader of Heidegger. And that's one way of looking at it or justifying it through the lens of Strauss's studies. But another thing is that I learned through Strauss, as so many people I think did, who read him and who have uh, taken him as their teacher, um, or as a commentator that they work with, that you have to be careful in studying intelligent books. You can't just dismiss them when something about them upsets you or is unclear. If you have reason to believe that somebody is not a bonehead, but a serious thinker, then you are obligated in a way to do maximum amount of effort in understanding the nature of his teaching. Mm -hmm. So I took the basic principles of Straussian scholarship or of a Straussian careful reading and in that spirit approached Dugan's corpus you know so it I have some reason to believe that this is a thoughtful man okay that Dugan is not just some buddy spouting off you know and if you have some background in philosophy and political theory and you have other exposure to his texts and to his lectures um you know that he's intelligent mm -hmm. and that there's something to learn from him and therefore that again in my view obligates it obligated me okay other people maybe feel different obligations but it obligated me to as much as possible study as much of his works as i can and try to understand the relationship between them so if he says heidegger is the deepest foundation of the fourth political theory but he doesn't elaborate and at the same time he has several books on heidegger well in order to understand the first statement you have to dig into the details of those other writings mm -hmm. so yes strauss is um a big component of the way that I became interested in Dugan, I would say. Uh, he accounts largely, like I said, there's the mysticism in Russia. Strauss doesn't have much to do with that. But with that middle pillar of platonic political philosophy, mm -hmm. Strauss is indispensable. Um, so there you go. I want to talk about um, Dugan's relationship or you know what he draws out of Heidegger. But first, um, talk about any parallels or, or, or any grounding of, of Dugan's thought that basically come from Greek antiquity. Well, uh, okay, I said at first that he's anti-liberal, anti-communist, and anti-fascist, that he feels like all three of those are inadequate political ideologies. And therefore, if you're not going to be a liberal and not going to be a communist, which is typical for the people that I'm interested in, it doesn't mean you're going to be a fascist. In fact, how can you be against fascism and find a new ground? So one of the things Dugan says is that you can pull the rug out from all three political ideologies based on the fact that they are modern. Mm. And that means that Dugan's thought has to have some account of the process that leads to modernity, speaking in terms of the history of philosophy, the significance of the specifically modern configuration of things, the interpretation of thought, the subjectivity, objectivity, rationality, and all the rest of it, temporality, and so on, and how you can uh, address that. So I would say that whereas Strauss, as a rule, I mean, this too is, this is as a rule. So there's a slight nuance here, but as a rule, Strauss juxtaposes to modernity, antiquity, the classical world, the ancients, Plato and Socrates above all, but also Aristotle, but nevertheless, you know, Plato, Socrates above all. Uh, Dugan says we should be open to a two-pronged approach because besides just the pre-modern, 
we also have the postmodern. And neither of those is strictly speaking modern. Of course, he can't accept the postmodern left fully because he's against that tendency. But nevertheless, he can incorporate specific insights of Heidegger and Nietzsche, specific insights of some of the left postmodernists if they have made an adequate description of contemporary postmodern society. So in other words, he doesn't only go back to pre-modern sources. But when he does, I would say that, I mean, Plato and Aristotle are important for Dugan as they are for any thoughtful person who's trying to understand the nature of modernity and who's trying to think through the expense at which we have modernity, you know, what we lost, how we got here and what we had to give up to get here. So for example, he has an excellent set of lectures on Heidegger's readings of Aristotle, phenomenological readings of Aristotle, but he also has, you know, a series of essays. Um, this wasn't originally published in English as a book. Uh, these were essays, various speeches and things that Dugan gave uh, in Russian that I translated and that were published together as a volume on political Platonism. So Plato is important for him. The Neoplatonists are important for him. Aristotle and the meaning of Aristotle for the phenomenological tradition is important for him. But, um, you know, you do also see him discussing, as I mentioned, postmodern themes and figures and ideas, sometimes critically and sometimes experimentally. Um, he does say in his writing and in his interviews that he's against the modern West, not against the West. He's not an anti-Western thinker. He's anti he's against Western political modernity. And that part of the aims that he believes he represents politically, ideologically, and intellectually is the revival within the Western world. So in his view, this is compatible with his project, the revival within the Western world of the classical sources of the Western tradition, which this are currently makes, I mean, under attack and so on. Yeah. I mean, that sounds similar to Strauss's project in general. Yeah. So this is where it gets interesting because uh, there are people who are not anti-American and who are not anti-Western and who are not pro-Putin in the sense that they want to betray their country for Russia and mm -hmm. all of that, but who find Dugan's thought interesting and appealing for part of the way, because for part of the way they share the same enemies and for part of the way they have the same desired outcomes. So for example, Dugan is an anti-globalist thinker, and there are American anti-globalists who can benefit from his criticisms. He's somebody who wants to restore classical learning. And there are people, as you well know, uh, Chronicles among them, I would say, to the best of my understanding, who are involved in that project of defending classical learning. And then where there's a disjunction or where there's a difference or where he, for example, you know, Strauss is very big on Socratic moderation. Uh, and Strauss also doesn't have, as he once put it, visionary expectations from politics or some sort of utopian expectations from politics. Mm -hmm. Whereas Dugan at times is less moderate, more visionary, and does have utopian expectations from politics. Mm -hmm. So it's intellectually very interesting to try to see how do we read Dugan in light of Strauss? How do we read Strauss in light of Dugan, given their similarities and accounting for their differences? Could you specify something specific about Heidegger's critique of liberalism that Dugan picked up on? Yeah, so one, maybe the most conspicuous one, the one that's in the fourth political theory is this. So he says, we're criticizing liberalism, communism, and fascism as ideological systems. And we need a kind of operation, you know, you need to find a, a way to do this coherently and um, productively. So he says, one thing we can do is identify the key actor of each of those political theories. Like who do they take as their fu fundamental underlying agent or unit of analysis, you know, the sort of X underlying them. So he says in liberalism, it's the individual mm -hmm. and communism, it's the class. And in fascism slash Nazism, it's the state or the race. Mm -hmm. And there's something to that as a simple version of what each of them regards as its most important component. So he says, if we, in trying to be on the other side of all of those political theories, are developing something, we need to have an underlying agent, an underlying unit, or an underlying X that isn't those. So what happens when you reject the liberal uh, individual, the class, the race, or the state? Who's going to bear the burden of your theorizing? And here in Fourth Political Theory book, he explores several possible alternatives, but ultimately he says Heidegger's Dasein, Heidegger's uh, uh, word for human existence as it is in its openness to being, is actually distinct from all three of those modern ideologies. 
It has a serious philosophical foundation and elaboration to it. And it allows us to produce experimentally the construction of an existential political theory rooted in Heidegger's analysis. Moreover, it also gives us a history of philosophy because Heidegger in his middle period writings had an account of the history of philosophy as a certain sort of uh, um, constriction or distortion or alienation or uprooting. And so, you know, part of trying to think about the nature of modernity, the crisis of modernity and alternatives to modernity is having an account of the history of philosophy. So Heidegger is useful both for providing a history of philosophy and for providing an underlying X that could be the basis of this theorizing. Mm -hmm. That sign in its exposure to being and the history of being. That's it, one of the more conspicuous ways in which Heidegger is present in his thought. Do you think that it's possible to call Dugan um, a leftist or a rightist, or does he transcend both of these categories? Or does he even attempt to? So when I was doing my comparison of Heidegger's reception in Dugan's hands and the French version, as I mentioned, I formulated it with the distinction Heidegger left and right. So a left Heideggerianism and a right Heideggerianism. Now, that's typically when people say left and right, they're not thinking about Heidegger. They map that onto many different things, like are you primarily for equality or primarily for hierarchy or whatever else, whatever else the case may be. In the case of Heidegger, I thought it was useful to think about left and right because the French Heideggerians, they like Heidegger's deconstruction. They like his tearing down. And they sort of like the freedom of the end of philosophy. Whereas Dugan likes the other beginning of philosophy, this other component in Heidegger's thought. Mm. After the deconstruction, a reconstitution, another beginning, inceptual thinking. So I thought you could differentiate that left and right. But when I interviewed him once about Heidegger in writing, and I asked him whether he identifies himself as being on the right uh, with respect to the reading of Heidegger, I didn't give him this explanation I just gave you, but I asked him more generally, he said, no, I'm not a left or right Heideggerian. I'm just a Heideggerian. I try to follow mm -hmm. Heidegger as best I can on the basis of what I understand about his teaching. Mm -hmm. So that's as applied to Heidegger specifically. Um, you know, more generally, it depends on how we define the terms. Sure. In one context, clearly he's on the right. But I call that right-wing anti-liberalism roughly, you know, because there are right-wing liberals, but that doesn't count uh, for our purposes. Uh, but at other times he borrows, you know, as a creative a thinker, I would say that he borrows sometimes freely from trends, even on the left, and not only on the postmodern left. So he once experimented with this combination national Bolshevism. So the national, so to speak, comes from the right, the Bolshevism, so to speak, comes from the left. Um, so it can be useful to call him a right-wing thinker, as I say, right Heideggerian or right-wing anti-liberal, but that can be limited, You know, that serves its purposes as well, and when it no longer serves them, we can change it up. I mean, it's funny because online he's accused of many contradictory positions. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes he's accused of being a Zionist agent. Sometimes he's accused of being a complete uh, Jew hater. Sometimes he's accused of being on the far left, sometimes on the far right. Mm -hmm. You know, but these categorizations, they can only take you so far. Ultimately, we turn to the books to understand how he categorizes his own thought. I think that's a useful uh, exercise. And there he doesn't call it left or right. He just calls it the fourth political theory. Right. Did, so where did Dugan come from? Was he like an academic in Russia or is he just an independent scholar? You know, what what made him someone that with authority? So I can't claim to speak for his whole life history or biography. There are good works written about uh, sort of his prehistory, you could say, um, his first exposure to, the, to military circles or intelligence circles and academic circles and underground mystic occult circles and all the places where all of the things that characterize him had their formative uh, phases. Uh, when I became interested in him, uh, I think at that time he was already in academia. So he did teach at Moscow State University for several years and he published studies there on theory of international relations and ethnosociology and he had other academic works written at the time. So uh, by the time I was doing my master's degree, yeah, he was still in the academic circles. But his prehistory, there are, you know, it's a fascinating biography of somebody who is brilliant and eccentric and understanding and who experienced all the kinds of things that put him in the position to try to provide sources of meaning and interpretation and direction uh, and understanding to the to the Russian people at the time of the transition from the Soviet Union into the post-Soviet period. He is somebody who, as I mentioned, had an interest in philosophy, mysticism, geopolitics, ethnosociology, 
um, is somebody who's as wide learning. And, uh, you know, my understanding is it wasn't easy to get access to all the books that he had access to in his youth. So there's a question how exactly did mm -hmm. that happen? But again, I've always been more interested in the nature of his thought than in the full blown biography, though there are biographical moments that are important, like when he introduced somehow his science of geopolitics into the military circles uh, at a time when the armed forces needed an interpretation of their place in the world that aligned with the kind of post-Soviet uh, state of affairs. So as the founder, I mean, he's, uh, besides being a phil philosopher and ideologue and author and all the rest of it, he's a political agent or activist. Mm -hmm. So he had he's formed political parties before, I think he's tried to be in elections before. Uh, ultimately, he has this uh, Eurasianist movement with mm -hmm. chapters and supporters and uh, young followers and so on. So yeah. he's, he's at the head of a kind of school of thought or organization. Uh, I can direct people who are interested. There's a nice book by Charles Clover called Black Wind, White Snow. And uh, there are a few other people I think who have written about the uh, biographical details. I want to get into his general reception in, in Russia. Um, maybe real quick, uh, maybe this is out of order here, but do you have any comment on the death of his daughter, the odd death of his daughter? I mean, it was obviously a, a murder, but do you think, that, do you have any, or do you even want to say or comment on it at all? No, I prefer not to. I mean, it's... Okay. Uh, Sensitive. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I think whenever. Yeah, I prefer not to. I could. Only thing I can say for those people who don't know is that um, his daughter was also uh, interested in and, and wrote about and talked about political theory and philosophy. She has books of her own that have been published since uh, since her death. Mm -hmm. And um, people who want to learn more about her, you know, they now have in addition to whatever the stories were about the about her assassination, um, her actual intellectual efforts. Yeah. So, so let's talk about his reception in Russia. I mean, is, do you have any sense of, you know, what, you know, the political philosophy of the you know academic world in Russia thinks of his thought at all? Is, is he even relevant as much maybe as he was 15 years ago? You know, anecdotally over the years, I've heard, oh, nobody, take nobody in Russia takes him seriously. Why are you even working on this guy? But there are, that's not correct in several ways. So first of all, let me remind you, the first thing I ever read about him said, in order to understand Russia, you have to understand Dugin. So that even at that time, it was clear that he's giving expression to something fundamental, fundamental for us when we try to understand what is this political project of Russia as a unique or distinct civilization in world affairs and not just as another European country. Okay, so he was able to express, I mean, it's an old question or an old theme in Russian thought, but the uniqueness of the Russian path. But not everybody has as comprehensive and well-articulated and long-standing, enduring, um, and intense exposition of that question, you know? Mm -hmm. So Dugan was relevant for sure and continues to be relevant, I think, as not only in purely philosophical terms, like, as I said, what do we learn about Heidegger when we compare his reception of Heidegger to the better-known leftist ones that we got through the French schools? But... He's relevant because when we try to understand anything Russia does on the world stage as a civilization state, any attempt to move towards a multipolar world or to interpret or analyze or direct that development, a Dugan's thought is, in my view, again, the uh, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit, sometimes obvious, and sometimes hidden mover of that especially when we're trying to understand it. You know, he's got one of the things of his that I translated called theory of a multipolar world. So you have the rhetoric of multipolarity. What's the theory of multipolarity? As mm. a Eurasianist himself understands it in the context that uh, Putin is talking about multipolarity. So it's like you would want, even if Dugin hasn't specifically sat down and talked with Putin, here's what you should mean when you say multipolar world. Um, he's giving the deeper explanation and interpretation of what that looks like as interpreted through the lens of Russia as a civilization state or Russia as a unique um, pole in a multipolar world. So that's part of it. And one other thing, just about whether he's taken seriously or not taken seriously in academic circles, uh, Leo Strauss, to show you how Strauss factors into my analyses of these things, he has a piece of writing called Living Issues in German Post-War Philosophy. Okay, I think mm -hmm. it's 1941. And when he sets out to describe what were the living currents of thought in post-war Germany, that starts with Spengler and um, goes through Schmidt and Weber and all of these things, 
He says, look, you had academics. Yes, you had professors of philosophy and professors, you know, you had people in academia, but you also had those thinkers who were still intelligent and they had the best characteristics of an academic in the sense of like uh, good scholarship, well thought through, our, you know, arguments articulated and all, all the rest of it, what you'd expect in the best case scenario. But they were somehow the living, pulsating, beating heart of the intellectual movements of the time. And Strauss makes the distinction between the sort of academic workers, you know, and these actual intellectual movers. And uh, it doesn't really matter, I would say, again, from my perspective, if nobody in Russian academia has ever heard of Dugin, or if they had all heard of Dugin, or, you know, or if 50% of them did and didn't, who uh, is on his side and who isn't, I don't know. But I also don't think that it's that it detracts in any way from his relevance as an expositor of specific Russian political theory and more generally a kind of postmodern um, right wing anti liberalism. Mm -hmm. When you, if you looked up, you know, like uh, Dugan on, you know, some just any news website, you know, you would get this sense that he's this very sinister, almost demonic whisperer in Putin's ear. You know, they, they've called him Putin's Rasputin, right? So, do you have any sense of um, to the extent? Is there any extent to which you know Russian foreign policy and um, you know, the its uh, goals and objectives have benefited from absorbing some of Dugin's contributions? Yes, you can see it in a few different ways. So one is has does he have? Can you generate sort of specific proposals and predictions and models and? trends and developments from his thought as they apply to Russia's foreign politics and even domestic politics, because, you know, one of the things he writes about in Foundations of Geopolitics, for instance, which remains untranslated as far as I know in English, is the, you know, inner reconstitution of the uh, post-Soviet space and so on to make it a strong enough pole in the multipolar world. So yes, you know, aspects of that, I would say, at least, you know, my focus is always philosophical, ideological, theoretical, and nevertheless, mm -hmm. you can derive specific uh, evidence that those things are adopted either because you heard them from Dugan or because Dugan gave expression to the inner logic of those developments. Mm -hmm. But then there are also people outside of Russia who have asked me over the years to brief them on Dugan's philosophy and Dugan's ideology and theory, not because they want to know more about Heidegger, which is a, a lot of them. A lot of the students who come to my school want to know about Heidegger and Dugan, but some of the private investors and entrepreneurs and business people uh, who have asked me uh, to talk to them about Dugan, it's because they are trying to understand on the basis of his thought, actual developments in world geopolitics that they mm -hmm. can translate into an investment thesis, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's oil trading or some other version of that. So there are people, again, uh, with... There, there are, let's say, let's put it this way. There are people who believe, rightly so, I think, that they can learn something important about the direction of the world on the basis of Dugan's thought, who are doing it not merely for theoretical purposes, but very clearly for, um, as I say, investment or policy or decision-making purposes. And that tells us something, I think, about the general merits of his analysis as a guiding lens through which to understand Russia on the world stage. Mm -hmm. It's funny to me because I don't claim to be an expert in Russia as such. Right. I've never even been to Russia. Now I went to Moldova to visit the city where my father was born on one occasion, mm -hmm. but I'm Canadian born, you know, I don't, it's, there are people who know, quote unquote, know Russia much better uh, than I do, who have been there, have friends there, have spent time there. And nevertheless, it just so happens that through the exposition of Dugan's political theory, people who do know Russia oftentimes say, wow, you've, you've managed to characterize in a way that few other people have done, especially few other Western people have done, our Russian self-understanding, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes psychologically, sometimes spiritually, sometimes politically, sometimes geopolitically. So that, I think, is another piece of evidence that he's crystallizing something actual and genuine and not just something spurious or imaginary. Mm -hmm. Let's let me talk about the fourth political theory. Um, what role does Dugan see Russia playing um, in, on the world scene? Well, it's a key player in the development of a multipolar world, as is China, 
as is Iran, as are the other um, contenders or competitors or alternate uh, powers, you know, most of whom are, as it happens, not happy with American uh, unipolarity or hegemony. So again, I say this is where it can get complicated because a person within America who loves America and defends America's position, even though it's something to learn from Dugan, may not want to buy into the full implications of it. But Russia is one of the key players for him in the move towards multipolarity geopolitically. Russia uh, should also be, and here, you know, kind of like take Bukela to a certain extent and El Salvador, who's coming mm -hmm. to America, I think is at CPAC yesterday, the day before, and explaining that when you follow these values and principles, your country can be in ascent. But when you, fo when you follow degenerate global uh, globalism principles, you are going to destroy your country and you're going to become an American El Salvador. So at times, Dugan also thinks that Russia can be, and, and his political theory can be a clarion call to people around the world who want to oppose the forces of global liberalism. Even those people within America, for the sake of America, America, American nationalists and patriots. So the geopolitical role of Russia in the world is to become a pole in a multipolar world, okay? To show that you don't have to be um, part of global liberalism to be viable. And that requires the development of certain resources and, and uh, so a sovereignty, economic, and all the rest of it, as well as on this ideas side of things. Russia can be the source. I mean, maybe people may think this is ridiculous and absurd. Maybe it is. I'm just trying to answer as best I can. Sure. A source for a teaching that is appropriate to the new kind of world order. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes the relevant conceptual distinctions. And that offers a viable alternative to global liberalism without being either communism or fascism. One of the things that Chronicles magazine has really emphasized since its inception is the idea of particularity. Um, American foreign policy and the role of American just you know policy in general should not be, in Chronicles' view, the spread of like these universal ideals like democracy around the entire world. Rather, America should focus inward on what's best for its own people and the preservation of its heritage and the continuity of, of its way of life. It should concern itself with the American people in particular and not some universalistic ideals. Um, do you think there's any analogy between that instinct and what Dugan's doing on behalf of defending the Russian heritage? Yes, partially because, as I say, he moves away from the interpretation of the human being as an individual, not that we are not individuals, but that the definition of ourselves as an individual with no other fundamentally relevant characteristics, that sort of abstract and therefore universal featureless individualism is not the right basis for a political teaching. It doesn't capture as many truths about what it is to be a human uh, and a citizen as a model should capture. So when I mentioned that he uses Heidegger's Dasein, one of his uh, elaborations of Heidegger's teaching, which Heidegger does not have explicitly, is the multiplicity of Daseins. So multiplicity is another way of saying particularity, if you think about it, because sure. particularity means many different kinds of ways, peoples, traditions, histories, and so on. Now, the challenge is always like, take Strauss. Uh, I'll be brief about this, but when he discusses, you know, Burke in Natural Right and History, he says, nice to have some reference to uh, your ancestors and to your particularity and to your tradition and all of that. But what about that in us, which is universal, if there is anything? So it's always the case that for philosophers, I think, uh, there's something about thought, okay, that on one hand can be deeply rooted, but on the other hand also seems to transcend particularity. Mm -hmm. There's something about thinking that is tends towards a universalism or tends towards a comprehensiveness. And you see this in Dugan's own work because despite his connection to and defense of and particular Russian identity, he writes when he does write broadly, you know, he writes about not only Russian thinkers, but non-Russian thinkers, not only Russian civilization, but non-Russian civilization. A very nice book series, series of his called No Omachia, like Nus, Intellect and Machia, sort of war is a more than 20 volume set, a philosophical analysis of civilizational multipolarity. So that impulse to cover a comprehensive scope is philosophical. And the question is, how can you be a particular localized rooted uh, person and combine that 
in the correct sort of way with the universalism of genuine thoughtfulness and thinking and not have the two be at war with one another, I think Dugan tries to accomplish that in part through the elaboration of Heidegger's uh, works with this idea of a multiplicity of Daseins and so on. It's not completely straightforward and it's a difficult puzzle, I think, for anybody, which is why Strauss was able to discuss it in Natural Right and History completely independently of the question of Dugan and Russia. Uh, but yes, he is somebody who wants to put an emphasis on the other elements of our identity, not racial and gender identity, but our heritage, our tradition, our peoplehood, our religious belief, our legacies. And that is, uh, for better or worse, something that his theory opens up and puts back on the table. I want to finish this up here with just some recommendations about getting started with um, Dugan, but I want to ask first, in particular, there's a little book you may have translated. I don't know the the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset. I think that's what it's called. Uh, have yes. you read that? That's usually what I suggest people start with. Yes. But I'm not well read in Dugan. Do you have any comments on that book in particular? Yeah, it's a nice one. It's uh, I have a video on it and an interview I did on it. My most popular interview, half a million views, uh, on the channel Blogging Theology. So. Uh, I do recommend it. It's nice because it's short. Not everybody wants to read a 500 page or 200 page <laughs> book. So it's short. It also has a nice combination of highly topical culture war reflections, sure. like being against Soros and uh, open society, as well as deeper philosophical reflections, like talking about the active intellect, mm -hmm. which I don't think you often find those two things uh, so closely uh, put together within the span of, you know, 90 pages, uh, 86 pages. Um, so yeah, that's a fine place to start. And if anybody wants my exposition of the book, um, they should see it by looking up, you know, my videos on, on it. Yeah. I'll make sure I link to that. Um, and then also you have this book in, uh, inside Putin's brain. Would you, that, would you consider this a, a starter, uh, book for Dugan or would you look elsewhere? Honestly, it's a, it's more advanced. It's for people who really want to know what is the intellectual foundation of Dugan's thought? What are the connections to Heidegger? You know, what are the details of his ethnosociology? How does he make sense of these kinds of things? So if you're, if you want a nice, punchy, but still well-fitting introduction, I think this book and my videos is a nice place to start. But if somebody is more, you know, is inclined to like the detailed conceptual analysis at a scholarly level with everything footnoted and cited and wants the weeds about how does, you know, how exactly does he employ the Heideggerianism? How can we make sense of that? You know, how do these components of his thought relate to one another? A lot of that is in um, inside Putin's brain, mm -hmm. inside quote unquote Putin's brain, you know, inside right, right, the exactly, yeah. philosophy of the man called Putin's brain. So it was my attempt to elevate mm -hmm. in an academically rigorous way, for the most part, the study of Dugan as a political philosopher. Is the fourth political um, theory, is that considered um, like important as a starter book or is that is that really complicated in your opinion? No, the fourth political theory is a good book. It was, it came out in 2012. It was, and in some sense does remain the best starting point. Although I should say the great awakening versus the great reset is probably a little bit easier, right? It is shorter. It's uh punchier. It's easier. Okay. The fourth political theory would be, I'd say next probably in level of complexity. And it's an important text. I have a course on it at millermanschool.com. I also did a series of interviews with Aaron, uh, Oren McIntyre mm -hmm. at Blaze Media about it. It's foundational in many ways because it's the one that's best known. You know, it came out first. It sort of serves as the core of many of his other books. Uh, there are things that are mentioned in fourth political theory that then get elaborated in books of their own. So if you need one quick book, Great Awakening versus the Great Reset, one okay. slightly longer introduction, fourth political theory, they make a nice one-two punch. And I'll tell you that when it comes to Dugan or any other author in general, my principles start anywhere and keep going. But these are two good starting spots. A person could read them, stop, and move on with their life if they wanted to. Hopefully some people are intrigued enough to uh, keep going, to keep reading. Okay. My final question, and then I'll let you go. Is there anything in Dugan that people should look for as applicable to our own um, difficulties in Western civilization now? Yeah, his criticisms of postmodernity are highly relevant, I think, because we're trying to understand what has happened. What's this war on our on our heritage, on our history, and especially on our intellectual history, on the great works of philosophy, the great works of literature, on everything that represents the dignity and decency and excellence of man. So his thoughts on education, I think, are relevant. And you do have some of that in The Great Awakening versus The Great Reset, which shows you why 
it's relevant. There's more in the book called The Fourth Political Theory on the interpretation of postmodernity. So that's very helpful. His conceptual distinctions, he has several of them, including this very model that you can be against liberalism, not be a communist, but not ipso facto be a fascist. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's in and of itself is a helpful conceptual distinction to make because a lot of times people will use that sort of logic as an accusation. You know, if you're not a liberal and you're not a leftist, you must be a fascist. Therefore, you want to kill millions of people. And, uh, you know, you're basically like evil incarnate. Well, that's right. not right. So his his basic conceptual distinctions can be useful. His analysis of postmodernity can be useful. The ways in which he calls for a return to Plato and Aristotle can be useful. I think that uh, all of that is good. Um, the ways in which he discusses peoplehood in his ethnosociology books, I have found that to be helpful. I know people I talk to about it also find it to be helpful. So th those are all those are all different ways that you can just because again, the point of all of these conceptual clarifications is something comes to light that previously was in the dark, or it comes to light more clearly than it did with another model. And mm. that's what we need. We need to, we need a language in which we can assess what's going on. Some people find that in Schmidt. Okay, no problem. Dugan refers to Schmidt as well. Some people find it in Burnham. Some people find it in Strauss and Heidegger and Nietzsche. And uh, Dugan offers us all of these different ways, including the traditionalist Gwenon and Evola. They can all be marshaled for us to think through the crisis of modernity, the crisis of higher education, and the crisis of the human soul when it's at risk of um, extinction. Well, I thank you for your time. I think um, I think there is a lot in Dugan that people can benefit from. I haven't read much, but I have read the books that we did talk about um, today. But just lastly, where can people find you and your work? So I teach millermanschool.com. That's where I have paid courses on books in the history of philosophy from Plato's Republic to Heidegger's Being in Time, Dugan as well as Strauss, Schmidt, and others. I'm on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Millerman. So I put out a lot of material there on political philosophy, on Dugan and other thinkers. And I'm on Twitter, M underscore Millerman. If you just look up Millerman, you'll find me. So those are my main platforms where I teach courses for uh, a fee, where I go online on YouTube for uh, free instruction and teaching and reading articles and so on. And Twitter, where I just uh, you know do what people do on Twitter. <laughs> right. Hopefully less of it. All of us are on there too much. But yeah, thank you, Michael, for your time. And we'll have you on again. Maybe we can talk to Paul next time. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you.